Um, so I have to say very clearly that these two poems are from a project, my next book, or one of my next books, where I'm writing letters to my eternal celebrity crush, Colin Firth. <laughs> and um, no, I don't know him, I haven't sent any of these letters yet, but I am, I just, it was a great prompt, dear Colin, and I went from there. So he may be, in fact, surprised when I eventually send him the book and hope that he writes a little blurb for the back, even if it's something like, this woman is completely insane. <laughs> I find it all. Also, given the uh, title of this reading, I chose the most risque of poems to Colin first to read first, then one slightly less to read second, although it does have the F word in it, so if you're, if you're worried about that, you can cover your ears. I could do like an earmuff sign, so you know. So this first poem was actually written based on a prompt uh, that I got from a friend, which is, look up the technical names of something and see if you can use those like Latin names in a poem. And this was names for seashells, which are surprisingly varied and interesting and highly sexual in a lot of ways. So, dear Colin, I promised nudity, so here goes. I think our private and beautiful body parts should be renamed. There should be as many ways to describe them as there are seashells. My darling, let me see inside your Lazarus jewel box. Thank goddess you are no sparse dove. Do you feel my fingertips lingering over your strawberry top, your incised moon? In the mirror you can see some of your triangular nutmeg, but you cannot taste it. With you, my tongue is a tuberculate marginula, and I call this move the heavy bonnet. Let me worship your Peruvian hat, your eager woody canoe bubble. After, we can lounge like shoulder blade sea cats. Why do humble sea creatures get such lush multi-syllables while we must choose between harsh Anglo-Saxon and Latin deprived of poetry? Let us all, like Aphrodite, rise gorgeous and wet from the sea, arraigned in descriptions worthy of our sweet and slippery selves at last. And if he reads that one and isn't appalled, then I'll be very happy. <laughs> All right, so this is another one from the same series here, Colin. Uh, it, it was kind of fun to write. I started out writing Dear Mr. Firth, but you know, after you write a few letters to someone, it sounds so formal, and it became Dear, dear Mr. Firth, Dear Colin Firth, and then finally just Dear Colin. I don't know, by the end, maybe it's going to be a nickname like Dear Sweetheart, <laughs> Dear Paul Darling, I don't know. Dear Colin, Listen to me sifting through the window like ash. I'm the fallout from some huge explosive catastrophe. <laughs> we all are. We're carbon, diamond, bone, burning. Every day I get older and for some reason the world doesn't panic. <laughs> I'm a grizzly bear standing on my hind legs, mistaken for Bigfoot. I'm a sun dog, a mini rainbow, winking down at you and your curly brown hair. I'm the dry boots someone is holding above her head while she wades the river. There's going to be an other side. You'd better fucking believe it. <laughs> Hennessy shoved her whole fist in her mouth, contortioned her jaw into a horse face, and then reversed birth her fist inside knuckles scraping past her teeth. Then, after turning her face side to side to showcase the armoire, attempting to tear through her cheeks, she popped the fist back out, a trail of drool following it, and took a bow, her hair hanging like Spanish moss before she snapped it back with a smile. For the first day of class, the teachers asked for each student to say something interesting about themselves. Hennessy could shove a whole fist in her mouth, she claimed, and after she performed the trick, her fist there one minute, swallowed the next, Everyone applauded, including her Prince Charming, the acne-free teenage boy of royalty, of parents who owned a second home, a beachfront house with a dock boat their prince would steal to drag the girls from his high school class on board. White, blonde, cut-off jeans, flip-flops, 
DTF. Then there was Hennessy, Dominican with ugly Haitiano skin and hair that sprang out like the springs from an old mattress. Hours she'd spend ironing her hair straight before stepping out into the Florida atmosphere, made up of something like a million invisible balloons rubbing against it, freezing it out. She had ghosted the years before, floated from class to class to the world's least effective haunting. Her eyes would glaze over at her prince charming. His teeth blinged from his silver braces. And with a wild ass mane, he looked a lot like Aladdin, but taller, wider, and with a dental plan. She would scribble down lists, things to do, visit a castle in Europe, go to Disney World, get married, live happily ever after. These notes she studied while watching Cinderella, or Sleeping Beauty, or Snow White, or The Little Mermaid. Her mommy found the list sticking out of her bedside drawer one day. You're Dominican, she said, scattering the bundle in the air. Not a maldita gringa. Stop acting it, or nature will knock you back on your ass. Whenever Hennessy saw her reflection, she was sure the mirror came from a fun house. How could she possibly look like one of those walking broomsticks from Fantasia? She wore hoodies with wizard robe sleeves extending past her knuckles to hide her chewed up fingernails. Jeans were a staple of her wardrobe. She stopped rubbing lotion on her skins eons ago, building up a deposit of ash on her knees and elbows. If her city was firebombed, she would still wave through the smoke and flames, sweating into a pair of denim. You can't be serious, her best and only friend Lizzie said, scanning her up and down. I practically came naked today. At night, she dreamt of a fairy godmother bleaching her skin into white chocolate, ordaining her the heiress of a Swedish fortune. The following year, after spending her summer in the Dominican Republic with her dad, eyes gawked at her. She thought her classmates were plotting to crack her skull open and lynch her from a tree. When Lizzie saw her scoot into her seat, she turned to her and said, holy shit, Beyonce, what happened? In the summer, she'd gone folk of bland mode. Her ass radiated out onto a, into a badang, stretching her jeans into yoga tights. When she noticed Prince Charming watching her, after she had popped her fist out her mouth and wiped the drool from her chin, it was the first time she felt less like Quasimodo and more like Esmeralda. From across the room, Prince Charming said, beautiful talent you got there. He grinned, his braces gone. He asked her to the homecoming dance with him. That day, she skipped down the Technicolor Road to her house and ogled the trees, the grass, the clouds, the gingerbread houses. The world was made out of tropical fruit skittles. She brushed her hair, fluttering blue jays and squirrels with googly eyes surrounded her window. She sang to them. She dyed herself blonde. At Lizzie's house, her scalp stung. She slumped over the bathtubs to sponge the excess paint off, creating a trough of honey. Later, Lizzie plopped on, down on her lap, hip against hip. Lizzie's face, eyebrows like caterpillar. Hair cut to her jawline, two piercings, one on her bottom lip, one on her nostril. This is gonna hurt a bit, open wide. Lizzie's fingernails dug into the tip of Tennessee's tongue, tasting of nail polish, with a needle pricked a bleed hole in her taste buds. Hennessy squeezed her shoulders and mule. There, there, Lizzie said, go spit. Her tongue was the size of a pomegranate for two weeks. What's the matter with you, her mommy said. You sound like peace and quiet. Her prince gave her rides to school now in his Snow White Mustang. The inside smelled of pine salt. At every stop sign or traffic light, he would drown the music so they would joust each other's tongues in silence. One day, he pulled into a parking lot. With a few minutes before class, he held down on her head. When she resisted, he held her and said, I love you, my princess. She sucked him, caught his blattering love juice in the back of her throat like a pitched jellyfish to a catcher's mitt. The piercing numbed the taste, thankfully. After she spat the white seed onto the sidewalk, she turned to him and planted a big, wet, lip gloss kiss. Homecoming. Hennessy's dress was the color of chewing gum. Thanks to her pink lily and white cotton Victoria's Secret fragrance mitts, she was like a freshly unwrapped strip of winter fresh. Her hair was fat fastened with a hairpin, crowned with a silver tiara. Her earrings were upside down trees in the winter, white, barren. People crowded the dance floor, dissipating as they spread away from the DJ booth. Hennessy was firing off, spluttering at a frequency only mice could register. He's amazing. Isn't he amazing? He told me he loves me. You see, the, you see the way he smiles at me? They were sitting at a round table. Prince Charming was getting her a drink, but it seemed he got distracted by his friends. 
He has a boat, you know. A boat. Can you imagine that? She laughed. Lizzie said nothing. You know, if we kissed at midnight, everything will be all right, like forever. She made phantom adjustments to her dress. Maybe we'll ride off into a distance with his Mustang. How amazing would that be? Sounds pretty amazing. I'm kidding, of course. The music dropped to a slow dance. People swarmed back to the table, sweating. Uh, the prince scooped in next to her, caressed her leg, whispered, let's get out of here. He nodded toward the exit, his teeth changing colors from the atmosphere. Lizzie grabbed her arm as they walked away. I think you should stay. You're kidding, right? She yanked her arm back and waved her hands in the air like a wand. Don't you feel the magic in the air tonight? She grabbed the prince, who was swaying with his hands in his pocket, and clopped away, her high heels made of glass. In the Mustang, he bit her neck and explored her tongue with his. He tasted and smelled of alcohol. This has to be by midnight, she said. Midnight and it's all good. He sped and swerved past straight and winding roads. Street lamps bathed his face in gold before it was warped by the darkness. Her purse vibrated. Thinking it was Lizzie, she yelled into the mouthpiece, Fuck off, this is what I want. Mira, coño, don't talk to me like that, said her mother. She shut it off. When the phone vibrated, she hit ignore. If we ever get married, we should have it in Europe, she said. Or Sweden. Her prince smiled, his eyes crinkling in the darkness. Sure, let's not talk about that right now, he said, swerving back from the left lane. The bottom half of the boat was colored black, like a bandana covering the mouth of a face, the windscreen its eyes. But in the darkness, it looked like it was floating in midair, like a magic carpet. He told her he forgot something and dashed to the house. From the boat, the ocean surface moved like a curtain in the wind. The salty air invaded her nostrils. The moon hung like a block of cheese. No clouds in the air. Perfect weather for fireworks. He dumped a boatload of items next to her, turned the ignition, rode out towards the horizon. The pile of items contained a touchscreen phone, leather wallet, engraved flask, half empty when she shook it, and a roll of golden wrapped condoms. As he drove on, his back to her, sometimes swaying a little too far to the right, before stumbling back in overcompensation. She glanced at the condoms. She clicked her tongue, piercing against her teeth. Then her phone rang. She pulled one of her earrings off and with the sharp end, punctured the wrapper with holes, perforating the entire roll with the dexterity of a switchboard operator. Perfect for midnight, she thought. At 12.27, he came at her. She expected a warm embrace, breathing into his ear while hugging him close, nibbling on his earlobe. Then they lie under the stars and talk about their future together, the life of the prince and the princess, staring in each other's eyes. When they kissed, whistling fireworks would explode across the sky. Instead, he turned her around like a dog and clasped her face against the bench, the plastic ridges sandpapering her face. When he finished, he crumpled backward and passed out on the ground. The ruptured condom was stuck. Her stomach rumbled. She threw up and tasted dirt. The wretch was soiled, full of worms. She gagged. Green leaves popped out of her mouth, unclasping like an umbrella. Her intestines were coated in battery acid. From her throat, she birthed a barbed wire log. Ridges scraped past her teeth. Her eyes twirled around full circle. A palm tree towered over her. The trunk was coated in blood. A coconut the size of a bowling ball plunked downward and cracked itself on her forehead. Thank you. Uh, this, is an, this is an excerpt from the short story. Um, to, make a long, to, to make a long setup very short, uh, Josephine is a woman well out of her element. I smelled the danger in the room. These two brands were as prickly as my lorish countrymen in matters of image and honor. They had strong drink in them and were looking for excuses to fight. I was happy that I had chosen simple leathers and high hunting boots instead of a more elegant dress. The flowing blouses and skirts, which I prefer for courts, would not play well in a Hubert house, so I came as a warrior, even as I came as an ambassador. Court clothes would have been absolutely prevented me from chasing down the man. My slender blade hung at my side, the traditional long knife opposite it. I will never understand the sword and shield fighting they do here in the East. First, they're too heavy. Second, I believe in being somewhere other than when a where a strike is landing. It seems insanity to me to take a blow, counting on the shield to absorb, and armor to absorb the impact. I knew enough of Huber's culture to know that I had but one chance. I slipped in between two towering brutes in broad red sashes, ducked past an iron-collared thrall carrying a tray of, a tray of roasted meats, and grabbed the wolf cloak man by the arm. He dragged me for two full steps before stopping. 
Instead of turning to face me, he reversed the grip and pulled me around in front of him. His breath smelled of sap, oh, rabbit and sour wine. That was not smart. I could not hesitate. I speak with my Lord's voice and his resolve. Our desires for an alliance is great. If you doubt me, I will draw my blade to prove it. I figured that would get his attention. He barked a laugh and let me go. You know the old ways, then. You're as foolish as I had hoped. I don't know whether Great Varig should be amused or insulted. You have time to arm yourself in return. I will bring my master. I watched him shove his way through an arched opening at the back of the hall. After he was gone, I turned and strode out into the night. The fresh air was a relief to my eyes and lungs. I enjoyed a dip, deep, rich breath while scanning the courtyard for a place to be alone. Spotting it, I crossed the yard, ignored by warrior, servant, and slave alike. I passed unnoticed beyond the glare of the yard fires behind the wall of a timbered stable. Uh, behind it, the wall of a timbered stable. In the near darkness, I sat cross-legged and closed my eyes. That's a better. I pictured myself sitting in an identical pose on a ledge halfway up the jagged peak of a great mountain. The setting sun made its last peak over the mountaintop, casting all of the glittering lake into shadow. Old, master of the deep calm, stood behind me in, the sh in that shadow, serene as the gliding moon, which had already begun its rise into the purpling sky. Where is fear? he demanded. The province of fools, I answered by rote. Who lives there? All men, I responded, continuing the mantra. What is your escape? The sands of solitude. Where will you dwell? The oasis of self. Where is fear? It could not follow. I took another deep breath of clean night air as I opened my eyes and stood in one motion. I crossed back across the courtyard toward the main keep, its noise now only a whisper in my ears. I am the gliding moon. I returned to the hall just as the Lord was entering. He was tall and spear thin, well older than I expected. The last few embers of red flapped into his ashen hair. As he came into the hall, the low rumble of his name echoed from the tables nearest the dais, picked up by the tables farther away, creating a tidal wave that rushed past me out of the room. He stopped in front of the dais and raised his hands for silence. With one final shout of Fari, the wave crashed. There were no long-winded introductions like I might pronounce in the court of my master. Varric's presence announced itself. Wolf Cloak motioned to be forward. As soon as I stepped toward him, the hall erupted in a chorus of derision. He looked me down and then up. I was wrong that you know our ways. You have forgotten to armor yourself. Even for ceremonial combat, this is dangerous. This fight is to the first true strike. Without armor, that blow may kill you. I am a Lorish second son. I am trained. Your bosom suggests otherwise. I shrugged. I cannot wear your armor. I will do well enough. His grin mocked me. We shall see. Turning to face his master, he raised his arms to quiet the crowd. My great and dread lord, we have a supplicant, one who would seek audience with Vare, master of all he surveys. She has invoked the old ways. More laughter and vulgar commentary swirled around me. In my mind's eye, I drew it all into one hand. Balling that hand into a fist, I raised it to my mouth and blew it into stardust. I am the gliding moon. We say let her, Wolf Cloak, Cloak continued. Let her stand with what honor she has earned and fight the least among us. Let Brog, son of Guitar, bear our banner. The wave of ascent surged through the throng. Barry quieted the crowd with an uplifted hand. A moment of silence hung in the air, and then he nodded his consent. The assembly roared again. A monster stepped from the smoke. If Brog was the least of them, I shuddered at what the greatest might look like. He was young, some 17 summers, but as tall a man as I had ever seen. His wiry black hair was tied back into a knotted braid that reached down his thick back. He had the beginnings of a full beard shadowing his face. Surveying his armor for looking for weak spots, I saw that it was old and dinted, but otherwise well maintained, suggesting that it was probably a trophy lo looted from some slaughtered foe. Instead of the Hubert band killer, he carried an immense two-handed sword slung across his back. It was clear that they meant to have this fight over with very quickly. I started working out ways to get inside that reach. Anxiety crept up on me. 
but I pushed it into a place it could not follow. I'm really interested in place studies. Um, and so I'm interested in how an action that occurs in one location or one setting becomes completely different in tone when it occurs in a different one. So I like to explore that in my poetry. So putting uh, kind of strange and startling actions into uh, atmospheres you wouldn't expect to find. So that's kind of where this poem is. It's called Kindling. One, <coughs> what happened to you? All your clothes are stained with light. People keep asking if I know you, if you're all right. Are you breathing fire up in your apartment? Did you ever tell your landlord where the rings on your walls come from? How moths scratch their tiny, dusty hands on the screen of your window, yearning to sleep in your hair. Two, you might as well sell all the ice I gave you. Blocks you said glow purple in the dark. I'm sorry if it hurt you when you had to walk under fluorescence, if you felt it in your marrow at the tips of your nails. Three. I heard your calling, your tenor reverberating through parking garage, concrete, sulfurous, heaps, smoke. Four. They never believed me when I told them I know a boy who can dream in reverse. They said, what does that even mean? It's called Rip Current. Um, and just some background. I was reading Dana Levin's Sky Burial um, right before I wrote this. And I was kind of in a falling asleep state. So anyway, you'll, you'll see kind of where I went with this. Um, Rip Current. One, the shadow of a girl half hidden in a doorway beckons me with a bent and curling finger. An avalanche is rumbling, I'm covered, inhaling snow. No, I'm knock-kneed moxious, my feet planted in sand, the tide drawing me out. Water pooling, pulling, am I sliding? Two, pool of Bethesda, mud, spit, turn around and say thank you to the one with the hands words, healing commands. Three, I cave, I'm carving into. Wooden block, I'm sandpaper late. I hammer holes, spell my name. Four, I weave ribbons through strawberry baskets. I dive for pearls, can't hold my breath long enough. Five, the rocks I collect kneel still on the sill of my window. Like Georgia's rocks, she learned to work with clay, sculpted as her eyes went peripheral. Six, fissure, fixed ratios, phlebotomy for the faint, just look away, don't rub your eyes black and blue. Seven, in the night, the cat yelping, late night custodian like anyone else during daylight, loiterer, vagabond, decipher the shredded notes, Remove the evidence. Tie a knot on the new liner of the waste paper basket. Eight. Hooded, hovering, the shadow is still beckoning. Nine. The swells break on the shallows. My feet, water receding, the sand sinking, pulling me to sea.